Shalom, saints, and thank you for joining us for our Searching the Scriptures episode. Each Thursday, we gather with the expectation that Jehovah is going to meet with us here. And so I want you to grab something to write with, grab something to write on, and of course, grab your Bible and prepare yourself for some inspirational teachings, quotes you can use, and of course, the truth that set men free. So stay tuned for Searching the Scriptures. Shalom, I'm Arthur Bailey, Chancellor of the Accredited Hebrew Roots University. Hebrew Roots University is the world's first and only accredited theological university that approaches scripture from a Messianic Hebrew Roots perspective. At Hebrew Roots University, you can earn an accredited associate's, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree in several disciplines. I'm ecstatic to announce our laborer's grant available to all HRU students. Our new laborers grant enables us to eliminate the $50 application fee and cover 50% of tuition costs across all degree programs, removing additional financial barriers and making our tuition even more affordable to all students. There are no prerequisites or prequalifications required. Simply apply and the grant would be automatically applied to your account. All students that apply today will be given a laborer's grant, which will cover 50% off all tuition costs and will be automatically awarded for each term the student is enrolled. You can apply now. If you have any questions at any time during the application process, please do not hesitate to reach out to our admissions team using the Have Questions section at the bottom of our website. The implementation of our new laborer's grant will provide access to as many people as possible from all nations worldwide who are desirous of higher education in ministry and becoming laborers in the end time harvest of the kingdom. Here at Hebrews University, we are dedicated to our mission to teach the true gospel of the kingdom, the gospel Yeshua taught, to people of all nations and to eradicate biblical illiteracy worldwide. We look forward to walking with you on this exciting journey. So check us out now at HebrewRootsUniversity.com. That's HebrewRootsUniversity.com. Don't wait. Take advantage of our new laborers grant. So apply now. HebrewRootsUniversity.com. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom, saints. The last thing Yeshua said to his disciples before he ascended was go and make disciples of all nations. This command is known as the Great Commission. Our ministries have taken this commission very seriously and developed a discipleship training program that will change the way discipleship has been done up to now. Most discipleship training programs are denominational in their approach and is doing exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees did in the days of Yeshua. Yeshua said, you search the world over to find one proselyte and you make them twice the son of hell as they were before you found them. The vision of Arthur Bailey Ministries and House of Israel is to be a worshiping people, an evangelistic community, a discipleship center, an equipping network, and a worldwide witness for Yeshua, the Messiah. In fulfillment of the Great Commission, we've developed Discipleship101.tv. Discipleship101.tv is a two-year seminary-level discipleship training program that takes a Messianic Hebrew roots approach to the scriptures. Now that we've completed this program, we are making it available to people around the world for free. We now 
have the opportunity to get it into every federal and state prison library and libraries around the nation. We also have the potential for getting this program accredited in universities and Bible colleges around the country. Now here's where we need your help. We need you to stand with us at the $1,500 level to help us get these workbooks printed and DVDs printed and duplicated in order to get them placed in prison libraries around the nation. For your help, we want to bless you with all of the workbooks and DVDs for each class as a thank you for helping us get this valuable information out. For your partnership, you will get all eight workbooks and all of the DVDs by partnering with us today at the $1,500 level. Thank you in advance for helping us get this valuable, extensive, Messianic Hebrews Discipleship Training Program to the nations of the world. By doing so, we're doing exactly what Yeshua said to do when he commissioned us to make disciples of the nation. Join us in this most important mission of making disciples of the nation by partnering with us today at the $1,500 level. You can partner with us at this level by sending your partnership check or money order to House of Israel. If you would like to pledge your partnership with us and make payments, please do so on our website at www.arthurbaileyministries.com. Just let us know you would like to make a pledge and make payments. Please help us get this material published so it can be placed in prison libraries and libraries around the nation. Partner with us today at the $1,500 level. Thank you. House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring, challenging, encouraging, deepening, strengthening, and enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. Shalom, shalom, saints. Greetings to all of you and welcome to our Searching the Scriptures. Today is Thursday, and on Thursdays we come together to search the Scriptures. Certainly want to welcome all of you here, those of you who are joining us online. We appreciate you joining in with us. Tonight we are going to be continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to be looking at chapter 8, and we have 20 verses to get through. And we're going to be talking about man does not live on bread alone. For those of you who are on our website, we certainly appreciate you subscribing for updates on our website. And if you would take a moment and do that while you're there. If you're on YouTube, you can follow us on YouTube. And while you're on YouTube, also uh, after service, you can check out our shorts and our videos there on YouTube. And if you're following us on Instagram, we certainly appreciate it. If you're not, 
then we encourage you to do so. So you can follow us on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, and of course, you can always subscribe to these pages and especially on our website. So if you're on Facebook, you can take a moment and like and share the teachings from tonight, invite others to join in with us so they too can be blessed. If you are, uh, would take a moment and like and share, we certainly would appreciate that. Also, at the end of our teaching today, you'll be given an opportunity to ask questions, to receive prayer, and you'll be given an opportunity to give. And if we can get this monitor on, I certainly would appreciate it. The vision of House of Israel is to be a worshiping people, an evangelistic community, a discipleship center, an equipping network, and a worldwide witness for Yeshua the Messiah. Our declaration for Jehovah's blessings. I declare this is my season for peace, power, promises, and prosperity. I declare the peace of Jehovah in my life and in my body. I declare the power of Jehovah to manifest fully in my life. I declare the promises of Jehovah fulfilled in my life. I declare the prosperity of Jehovah to permeate every area of my life. And I declare I will walk in obedience to Jehovah every day of my life. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be here tonight. We thank you for your presence in the midst of us. We thank you for being with us, for waking us up this morning, for being with us over the course of, to, of the day, and for your assembling in the midst of us. And we pray, Father, that you will move mightily in the midst of us today, not only in this place, but in the places and spaces where people are joined together to watch this, this teaching tonight and those who will watch the video uh, at a later date. We pray for your anointing that destroy every yoke to be with us today, that you heal, that you deliver, that you set free. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us the ability to comprehend, give us the strength to take those things that you give to us, that you show us, that you speak to us, and that you give us the ability to comprehend and show, show us how to incorporate them in our lives on a daily and consistent basis. We bless you. We honor you. Forgive us of our trespasses, our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, creating us clean hearts. Renew the right spirit in us. Again, Father, as we go through this teaching, reveal to us those things that you will have us to see, and then bless us in your word today. Be glorified in us as we take that which you revealed to us and walk it out. And so we thank you, we bless you, and we honor you in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. So today, I wanted to uh, talk about man does not live by bread alone. And as you're going to see in this teaching tonight, that not only is this in the Torah, but Messiah himself quoted it as he was dealing with the devil in the temptation in the wilderness after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. When it comes down to Jehovah's promises and blessings, they are connected to the covenant he made with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel. Now, after 40 years of wilderness wandering because of their lack of faith in Jehovah, the children of Israel had to be reminded of the covenant they made and how their blessings and promises were contingent upon them keeping their part of the covenant agreement. Many today don't necessarily realize that when they ask Messiah to come into their lives, that there is a covenant that is connected to this ask. There's that which the Almighty promises to do, and that is that he's going to save, that he's going to deliver, that he's going to fulfill his part of the relationship that we enter into, but there's also a responsibility on our part. Our part is to walk into in obedience to the instructions that is given to us by Messiah. Now, we know that according to the Gospel of John, that Yeshua was the Word that was made flesh, this Word that became flesh and then dwelt among us. And so we've come to realize as we 
go through his word that not only is Yeshua the man, the person in which we put our faith in, but Yeshua the word is the part that we walk out in our covenant relationship with the Most High. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 in verse 1 it says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live. And so we see the first thing that is communicated here in verse 1 is that life is connected to Jehovah and his word. That life is connected to Jehovah and his word. As he said, all the commandments that he's giving them th that day, they shall observe to do. Why? So that they may live and then they will multiply and go in and possess the land which Jehovah swear unto your fathers. And so this Swearing this um, covenant agreement that Jehovah made with the fathers began with Abraham. In fact, it goes all the way back to the garden in the sense that when he dealt with the man and the woman after their disobedience and the serpent who was a player in the uh, disobedience and fall of man, that the Almighty made a covenant back then concerning the seed of the woman. As we progressed, we see that when he called Abraham out, that he made a covenant with Abraham, and that covenant was based on the circumcision. Now, what many fail to realize is that there is a circumcision of the flesh, and there's also a circumcision of the heart. That is that which the Almighty will do in us, and then that is that which we are required to do concerning him and what he is commanding or instructing us to do. And so that relationship that he swore with Abraham and then he carried it over with his son Isaac and then with his son Jacob, which is now, which he changed his name to Israel, which is now being carried out with the children of Jacob or Israel. Ancient Israel's life, their posterity and occupation of the land was and is contingent on their obedience to Jehovah's commandments, and so is ours. So our relationship <clears throat> with the Almighty is based on our agreement to obey him, and in that agreement, he has made some promises to us. He has promised to make sure that all of our needs are supplied. He has promised to take care of us, to fight for us, to deliver us. In fact, part of his promise has to do, and we'll see this as we get into Deuteronomy 28, and in this particular verse, he's going to talk about wealth. I know that that is a tough subject, especially for some who have been in Christian church, but believe it or not, the commandments are connected to wealth. And we'll see that as we get around verses 17, 18, and 19. The purpose of Jehovah's commandments given to Israel was because Jehovah war wanted Israel to live, to multiply, and possess the land. Now, that's the first part of it. But once they got into the land, he wanted them to prosper. He wanted them to be successful after they occupied the land. And this, we see that after Moses was dead, Jehovah instructed Joshua. And he told Joshua in verse uh, 6, Joshua 1, he said, now, early he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And now he's transferred the responsibility of Moses on to Joshua to take the children of Israel into the promised land to occupy it. So now he's giving Joshua these instructions, and he says to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Now he's going to need this courage because he's going to face some pretty uh, tough people as he go to possess the land. He says, be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So we see here that Father is fulfilling the promise that he made to the fathers 
to their children. He says, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall make you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, and you shall have good success. Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for Jehovah your God is with you wheresoever thou goest. Now, interestingly enough, this is the promise Yeshua made as the word of God to those who he commissioned to take the good news, the gospel of the kingdom to. He says, lo, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. So that means that no matter where we go, if we're operating in obedience to his word, he is there with us. He is fighting for us. He is delivering and saving and providing for us. Our responsibility is to walk in obedience to his word. Jehovah's leading Israel in the wilderness for the 40 years after their rebellion was designed to show them what was in their heart and teach them to put their trust in him. Now, the children of Israel had an issue with trust. They had an issue trusting Jehovah. To trust Jehovah, that means that sometimes we have to take the eyes off of ourselves and put them completely on him. Now, the problem with that is that you can't see him. But here's the thing that you can see. You can see his word. His word is very clear. Although we can't see him in spirit, his word is spirit, and his word, which is spirit, is manifest on the pages of the book we call the Bible. So we got instructions. We've got written instructions, but we're also going to see that not only did they have written instructions, but they also had the voice of Jehovah, which goes to the title of this message, Man Shall Not Live By Bread Alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Because the voice of God is with us because he is with us. Now, this is an important piece. Because if he is with us, that means that wherever we are, he's communing. In that communing, he's communicating. In that communicating, he's telling us and he's trying to guide us and lead us and in the process, correct us because he loves us. So why do he want us to listen and obey? Because he wants us to prosper and to be successful. And you shall remember all the way which Jehovah your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Now, this is a mouthful. Why? Because no matter how long we've been in church, no matter how many times we've read the word, no matter how much scripture we've memorized, there is the two of us. And it's always to our advantage to remember that there are two of us dwelling in this physical structure. There's the carnal man who wants to do what it wants to do. There's the spirit man which has been born again, but is also in infancy stage and is in need of the milk of the word. As this spirit man, which is being fed the milk of the word, grow in statue, then it moves to strong meat. Now, the reason why this is important is because until the spirit man, which is the born-again man, grow in maturity, 
the carnal man is always going to try to be the dominant force in our lives. That carnal man wants to please self. It will do what is necessary in order to prove self. And, 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 and what I mean is that it wants to please the desires of its flesh, of its carnal nature. This is the piece of us, the part of us, that come into this walk and into this faith. Now, the difficulty for us is we see people in the carnal state. We see people in the carnal state, and these are the examples because we are accustomed till we learn how to be led by the Spirit, we have no choice but to walk by sight. All the things that we have learned in life, we have learned by visual and by hearing. Things that we have observed, things that we have heard. These are the things that lead us and guide us and, and create desires within us. Now, the word which is to be heard is hard to visual unless we read it, but when we read it and we put it in us or we allow it to permeate in us, then what will happen is that it will begin a transformation process within. That transformation process if allowed to go unhindered, is going to bring us into a state of maturity in the spirit side, which is now going to become more dominant than the carnal side. And this is the challenge most of us have, is that there's this struggle within us of the spirit man growing, but the carnal man that has, has, has always been there, wanting to dominate, lead guide, direct, and pursue its desires. And this is why we got to put that man to death. So what is he saying? He wants to prove, he wants to show us what is in our heart. Now, the Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. But also out of the abundance of the heart is what is going to produce the kind of fruit that tell people what kind of person we are. We're going to respond. We're going to do. We're going to pursue the things that is in our heart. Now, unless the Almighty is filling our heart with his presence, then we are going to pursue what is already there. And this is why it's about getting the word from our head off the page into our heart. Our heart, according to Jeremiah, Chapter 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful. The heart is cunning. The heart is, is, is always scheming above all things. And it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? But then in verse 10, it says, but I, Jehovah, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So there are two things that is going to show us what's in our heart, the words that we speak, and then our actions. Our actions is going to show what is in us because we're going to manifest what's in us and we're going to speak what is in us. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, we act. And so if you, wanna, if you don't know what kind of person you are, just listen to what you say and watch what you do. And that should tell us, you know, who we are now. When that word gets in us and we begin to apply his word, that's going to begin that transformation process. And we're going to see that our actions and our words are going to begin to more align themselves with the word. So Jehovah's telling the children of Israel, he says, remember the way, remember from where he brought you from, and then remember how and who brought you. And this is so we don't forget. You've heard people say, you know, some people, how when they get to a certain place, they kind of forget where they came from. They start acting differently. <laughs> they have a tendency sometimes to, you know, look down on folks who are still like they used to be. 
or whatever the case may be. But the bottom line is that who, where they came from and where they are has changed them to the point to where they've forgetting, forgotten where they come from. Life has a way of demanding our focus. The, li the demands of life forcibly engages us, and if we are not careful, we will engage in life in our own strength. It is so easy to forget Jehovah unless we purposely focus on him and forcibly remember the he is right there with us wherever we are or wherever we go. Now, I tried to put this in, in a way that the key word here is forcibly. Why? Because that carnal nature is tricky. The heart is very, very tricky. We have a tendency to talk ourselves into doing things. We have a tendency to even talk other people into doing things. And then we make excuses for the things we do. And we always got good reasons for the wrongs we've done. And we always, almost, well, let me say, almost always point the finger at somebody else for the, for the, for the reason, as a reason for why we've done uh, the things that we've done. But the bottom line is that our flesh is really trying to satisfy our, our, our flesh. That's the bottom line. There are things that we want to do. And the sad thing about it is that there are some things that we want to do that we know are not good for us. I often think about people who have um, issues going on in their lives. One, diabetes. When folks who have been diagnosed with a disease that those who have experienced it and live with it know that it is, it is a monster. And there are ways in which people can confront this disease, but it means that they have to imply, they, they have to employ discipline to, to deal with it. And in that disciplinary process, there are things they know that if, if they do these things, if they eat these things, if they engage in these kinds of activities, it's detrimental to their health. And yet, knowing that these things are detrimental to their health, they do them anyway. Why? Because they desire. There's desires in people. People like certain foods. They they like certain certain treats. And 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 the doctor says, as a diabetic, you can't have these things. That if you eat these things, it's going to have these effects on you. And ultimately, you could end up losing body parts. But people say, I like these things, and I gotta die somehow. And so even though they know these things are dangerous for their health, they engage in it anyway. And it's not just that. I just use that as an example. There are so many other things that people engage in that they know that it's going to create problems for that which they desire. And what do they desire? They desire to be healthy. They desire to be whole. You have people who desire, it's like, why is it a person who desired to have a healthy family, a happy, healthy family, engage in activity that is going to counter the happiness and the health of the family? You see, that's that old carnal nature, and it's deceitful. It is deceitful. It is desperately wicked, and it will turn on itself and every body that it cares about, which is why that person has to be put to death. And so the Almighty is saying, listen, I'm doing all these things. I'm taking you. First of all, you were at the threshold of the promised land, but you wouldn't trust me to go in and take the land that I said you could take. So that shows some is in your heart. 
What's in your heart? Fear. That's an issue. Fear was an issue. And so because they refused to, now they were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years when they could have been enjoying the fruit of the land. And now he's saying, I'm doing these things because there's some things in you that you need to recognize is there because they're sabotaging the very thing that you say you want. They're sabotaging the things you're believing me for, the promises that I've made because you will not get yourself in check is going to cause you to not enjoy the promises of the covenant agreement that we made together. And so he wants us to deal with us. He wants us to confront us. And this is a, this is a forcible thing. This is why, you know, you should, John says the kingdom of God suffers violence. But the violent take it by force. In other words, if you want to, pr- you're going to have to press. There are things that you're going to have to do in denying yourself. And this is what Yeshua says. If anybody is going to come after me, they're going to have to deny themselves. And how often? How often? See, you can deny yourself today. But then something happens. And you kind of slip. Some folks saw backslide. And now you set yourself back. And then you say, okay, I'm going to move forward and I'm not going to do it again. And something happens and you slip and you backslide. And then you make, brothers and sisters, this, this, this heart <laughs> is deceitful, is desperate. For the 40 years of Israel's wilderness wandering, they were led by the spirit of Jehovah. Jehovah was with them. Jehovah went before them. Jehovah fought their battles. Jehovah fed them and gave them drink. Jehovah supplied all of their needs. And what did they do? Complain. Murmur and complain. A demonstration of trusting Jehovah is manifested by keeping Jehovah's commandment. How do we demonstrate our trust in Jehovah today? This is an issue that many folks have. You see, if I'm a Sunday-minded person, guess, how, guess what day of the week I'm good on? You know, I'll do good on Sunday, go to church, man, and do all the godly stuff. But the other six days. And see, this is the difference between a church, a going to church mentality and being the church mentality. You see, the doing church, people go to church. The being church is a seven-day, 24-hour-a-day responsibility. That means on Monday, I'm the body, I'm the ecclesia, I'm the called out. On Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm the ecclesia, I'm the called out. On Sunday, as a Sabbath keeper, on Sunday, I'm called out. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm called out. I'm just not called called out and set apart on the set apart day. I'm called out and set apart every day. And that's how I have to act. Every single day. Verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manner, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Jehovah doth man live. Now, when you think about it, if if you read Exodus Numbers or Exodus Leviticus Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you look at this experience that the children of Israel had with Jehovah, there were three primary issues that the children of Israel had. One, they had an issue with the giants in the land, the people. They had a fear of, 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 of those men, of those nations. That was their, their first Um, um, real issue. But the second two was a continual because during the entire 40 years of wondering, what was their two complaints? We hungry. (laughs) Okay, all we eating is manna. 
We want some flesh. We thirsty. Hungry, thirsty. Hungry, thirsty. Hungry, thirsty. And it was those things. And, of course, in between that was, of course, you know, they, they wanted a little in entertainment. So those are the issues that created problems for the children of Israel. And Jehovah wanted them to know, listen, you're, you're, you are pursuing food and drink. The things that you are pursuing is the things that is in your heart. I know you have need of those things, but let me tell you where the life is. The life source of your, of your existence is in his word. The life source of your existence is in his word. The words that come forth from his mouth. And he said in his word that you are not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Jehovah. Now, in Exodus chapter 19, we see that this word, the voice of Jehovah, was manifested by the thunder that was on the mountain, the voice of the trumpets. In chapter 20, he begins to speak the voice of Jehovah. They hear his voice as the thunder coming down from the mountain, and all of those words that he spoke to, they couldn't take it no more. And he wanted them to know his voice. What's different today? My sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. The voice of strangers there will not follow. There are other voices. What are these other voices? The, 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 the great voice is not the devil. The greatest voice in our head is ours. The things that we see other people have, the things that we want are based on what we see. I once heard a profound word, and it makes so sense, so much sense, is that man don't know what he want, he only knows what he knows. He only want what he knows. You see, our desires are based on the things that we know exist. What separates some people from other people is that there are things that people create in their head and then they make them. They create in their head ideas, business ideas, invention ideas, things that don't already exist but become an existent in their head. It, 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 it exists in their thinking. These are the ideas, some of them that the Almighty will give us. Some, well, all ideas come from him, but many of them are hijacked and used in a way that they would, they would be credited to man. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with Father giving man an idea, but the bottom line is that if the idea comes from him, then man should give glory to the Almighty for the idea that he has given them. Amen? And so, these words that come forth from the mouth, the biggest complaint Israel had in the wilderness was related to food and drink. The biggest concerns people have today is related to food and drink. Yeshua quoted this verse to the devil during his temptation in the wilderness in both Matthew and Luke. And this is what, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Why? Because he was hungry. The Bible says he was hungry. The things that people will do for food, the things that people will do for a drink or something to drink, it's amazing. But now the devil is trying to tempt the Almighty. He says, I know you're hungry, but if you be the son of God, make these stones bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's a powerful statement. And so, as I've said, when we're going through Matthew and then again 
going through Luke is that when it came down to the devil, the, the Messiah, um, Yeshua didn't use New Testament quotes <laughs> to defeat the devil. He used the Torah. And that just goes to show the power of Torah when it comes down to the temptations of the devil. The power of Torah when it comes down to the temptations of the devil. And then, of course, in, Ma in Luke, he said the same. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. And Yeshua answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The biggest complaint Israel had in the wilderness, as I stated, was related to food and drink. And of course, the biggest concerns people have today is related to food and drink. But this is what Yeshua said. And I constantly find myself quoting this in my mind, in my head, meditating on it. He says, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. That is, putting first his word pursuing his word, living his word. So every day, every decision that we make, all that we do, we need to know, okay, what does his word says about this? My decision, well, what is, the, what is the counsel of his word? Verse 4, Deuteronomy 8. He says, your raiment wax not old upon you, neither did your foot swell these 40 years. What is the other concern beside food and drink that men have? What they going to wear? What they going to wear? Nobody wants to come out of the house naked. Of course, unless they're in some nudist camp, and those are rare. But in, in, in the real world, people want to look pretty decent when they come outside. They want to wear nice things. I remember as a child growing up and going to school, and, you know, you got those folks whose parents bought them expensive stuff, and, and our folks bought us stuff to cover our behind. <laughs> you know, it's like you see the other children, they got the, the, the gym shoes with the star on the side. We got the kind that you run up and down the court, you slip and slide. It's got no traction. It's got, you know, you <laughs> but hey, you got something on your feet. And so food and drink and then clothing becomes a real issue. Here again, Yeshua said in Matthew 6, he says, Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Again, Father has promised to meet every last one of our needs. Now the question is, do we trust him to do that? Deuteronomy 8, 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so Jehovah your God chastens you. Now the Hebrew writer expounded on this verse. He says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speak unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of Jehovah nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom Jehovah loveth, he chasteneth, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastes not? But if you, without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, if we have had fathers of our flesh which corrects us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verify, verily, for they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seem to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And then in the Revelation, it tells us, 
as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be, je- be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent. Back to Deuteronomy, verse 6, chapter 8. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of Jehovah thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Now, the land Jehovah was bringing Israel into was a land that was fruitful, fertile, and abundant in everything Israel would need or want for their livelihood, success, survival, and wealth for generations to come. In verse 7 we read, For Jehovah thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass, and see, this iron, I mean, that's money. Money in the, in the, in the, in the dirt. <laughs> that iron, iron ore is a material used to make furniture, utensils, implements, tool of iron. And so axe heads, I mean, this, this stuff was mined and then made into manufactured goods. The same with brass, copper, bronze, fetters of copper. As value. And of course, this is the kind of material that is used, again, to make expensive ware. They're in the the hills, plenteous of it. Work for people to dig up, to mine. Manufacturing jobs. I mean, all types of prosperity in the land that he's taking them into. Deuteronomy 8.10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless Jehovah your God for the good land which he has given you. So what we see, we see wealth, success, and abundance can cause one to forget where they came from and puff individuals up with pride. And this becomes an issue. It becomes an issue for individuals who think that that which they have accumulated or accomplished, accomplished, is of their own doing. He says, beware that thou forget not, forget not, forget not, Jehovah your God, in not keeping his commandments and his judgment and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Now, notice what he says. Beware that thou forget not Jehovah thy God. How? In not keeping his commandments. So how do we forget God? That word to forget, to ignore, to cease to care, to forget, to be forgotten. All of these, he says, don't do that when it comes to me. How does one know they have forgotten Jehovah? They ignore his commandments and his judgments and his statutes. They cease to care for his commandments and his judgments and his statutes. And so a person can go to church and yet believe They're not responsible for the commandments, the judgments, and the statutes. And as a result, be in the so-called house of God, but forget God because they're not honoring his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. Verse 12, lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Can you see the abundant wealth in these verses? You're going to, you're going to, you got iron in the, in the, in the, in the dirt. You got brass in the dirt. You got all types of fruit trees. You got barley. You got land. You got houses you didn't build. You got wells you didn't dug. You got springs and and depths of water springing up out the hills, springing up out the ground. You've got all of this multiplication in your herds, multiplication in your flocks, multiplying silver, multiplying gold, and all that you have is multiplied. In other words, you got a lot more now than you had. (laughs) 
Then thine heart be lifted up, and you forget Jehovah your Elohim, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I both know because we've got the whole Bible in our hand, in our possession, that there were time after time after time after time after time that the people of Jehovah forgot the commandments of Jehovah, and they paid a dear price. They paid. People are paying today because they're following after their own desires instead of surrendering and submitting to Jehovah's will. This lifted up, be lifted up and forget. This lifted up is to rise up, to be lofty. You know, in the uh, second part of this definition, it deals with to multiply, to magnify oneself, to exalt oneself. Now, the word pride is not there, but that's what it is. When one exalts oneself, they're lifted up, they're puffed up. That's pride. And they allow their pride to guide them, and they allow, allow their pride to lead them. And people in pride, they have issues that, you know, they don't even realize sometimes that they're operating out of a spirit of pride. And that is also deceitful. Yeshua said, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James wrote these words in James. He says, but he giveth more grace, wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. So what should our response be? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm telling you, the enemy has nothing other than the only thing that he can use against us is, our, is, the own, is the desires of our heart. If, if you don't have a desire to rob a bank, he can't convince you to rob one. If you don't have a desire to do, do drugs, he can't convince you to do it. If, if you don't have the desire to do something, he can't tempt you in that area. But in the area that you have a desire, if there's areas in you that already exist, the enemy is going to probe and scan and find it. And once he probes, scan, and find it, guess what he's going to dangle in front of you? He's going to keep on dangling it like that carrot on the string. He's just going to dangle it and dangle it and dangle it until you bite at it. Just like that hook, that worm on the hook for the fish. He just dangle it in front of you. But if there's no desire in you for those things, no matter how much he dangle it, you'll always be able to just simply resist. But the things that you have a hard time to resist, those are the areas you find that you need deliverance. He also says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, weep, and let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of Jehovah, and he will do what? He shall lift you up. Verse 15, Deuteronomy 8. It was Jehovah who led you through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint. Now, here's something that is absolutely amazing to me. In the 41 years, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. They encountered serpents one time that we know of. Here he says, he led you through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions. Now, in all that time being led into the wilderness, they should have encountered serpents or snakes or scorpions but they didn't. The wilderness were filled with fiery serpents. That word fiery deals with poisonous. Were filled with poisonous serpents. However, the only time Israel experienced the fiery serpents is when they murmured against Jehovah and Moses. And here in Numbers, Numbers 21, it says, And the people spoke against Moses, against God and against Moses. Wherefore, 
have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread. There is one of those complaints. Neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this, this light bread. So what you've given us, we don't like. And what we want, you won't give us. And our soul loathed it. And Jehovah sent fiery serpents among them. Jehovah sent fiery serpents among them. Now, the serpents were already there, but they were forbidden. But now that they're murmuring and complaining, it's almost as if he's, he's opening the hatch. It's like he's got the serpents all around them, but now he's giving them the command to go in among them. And when you think about the whole ark experience, Jehovah sent those animals to the ark. You see, unlike man, the rest of creation obeys Jehovah's command. The sun, the moon, the stars, everything that he creates obey his commands, his instructions, with the exception of man. So he, as we know, according to Noah, he put the fear of man in the heart of the serpent, but now he's telling the serpent to go in amongst man. And what do they do? Jehovah sent them. That's what he says, verse 6, and Jehovah sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now, why weren't they being bit all along? <laughs> the fear of man was in their heart until Jehovah said, go, and they went. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against Jehovah. Now, notice this. The serpents come. They've been, they've been out there all along, but now they come, and the people realize, hey, these serpents aren't supposed to be amongst us. So, Jehovah allowed them, or he sent them. They recognize they've sinned. They go to Moses. They know they've murmured. They know they've complained. And then they ask Moses, pray unto Jehovah that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And Jehovah said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he look upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. All man had to do was look at the pole. What did he say? Make a serpent of brass and everyone that is bitten. Now, these are fiery serpents. And when the, when the serpent bites somebody, the poison enters into them, right? He says, even those that have been bitten, if they simply look. So Moses is given the instructions. He takes a serpent, he, he takes some brass, he, he hammers it, he makes a serpent from that brass, right? Set it on a pole and said to the people, those of you who have been bitten, all you got to do is look at this pole. What is that? Following an instruction, looking at the pole, and those who had been bitten, when they look upon it, they shall live. Now, a person could say, I ain't looking at no pole. That's foolish. Look at a pole for what? I'm about to die. I've been bitten by a serpent, and you know when serpents bite, that poison enters. It's just a matter of time, and you did. But those instructions. Now, Yeshua used that event to illustrate the method in which he would be lifted up and killed and the faith required for those who would want eternal life. John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but what? Have everlasting life. Deuteronomy 8, 16. It was God who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers knew not, that he might humble you and that he might prove you to do thee good at thy latter end. 
Now, here's the other interesting thing. The punishment of the Almighty was to humble the people. Because the reason why they were in the wilderness all this time, during this time, for this particular purpose, was because of disobedience. And now he's trying to teach the next generation. It says the parents were hard-headed, they're going to die in the wilderness. But the younger generation, their children, we're going to raise them up. And some of them almost made the same mistakes as their parents made. But now they're at a point, he says, listen, you need to pay attention to what I did to your parents. You need to see what I did to your parents because that's what you got coming if you choose to obey me, disobey me like they did. But even amongst them, there were some who did obey me. And they're the ones who's going to go into this land. And Joshua was one of them, and another one was what? Who? Caleb. But those who are now about to go are the children of those who rebelled against the Almighty. And he said, I fed you in the wilderness. Why? To prove to you and to humble you so that I could do good for you in the end. And you say in your heart, after all of this, Father, bring them out of slavery, load them down with silver and gold in Egypt, take them through that great and terrible wilderness with serpents that he kept at bay until they disobeyed and complained, and he sent them amongst them, and then made a way even after he sent the serpents amongst them that they would live. He says, I'm doing all of these things to teach you some things, to humble you, to teach you. One, that man that should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of my mouth. Now, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take care of you. And then I'm going to bring you into a good land. There's going to be trees and you didn't plant Wells you didn't dig, houses that you didn't build, and even if you build goodly houses based on the resources that is available to you on the land that I'm giving you, don't ever get to the point to where you think all this stuff that you've accomplished, you've accomplished it on your own. My power, my mind, my hand, don't ever come to the conclusion that after all I do for you, that you think you did it for yourself. Don't say in your heart, my power and the might of mine hand has gotten me this wealth. Again, the people now, he, he's projecting on them that there's going to come a point in their, in their walk, in their life, after they come into the land, that part of the covenant that he's promised them is wealth. You see this? Verse 17 says, when you come in, don't let yourself get to the point to where you forget and then say, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. What wealth? The wealth that they're going to experience. Why? What has wealth got to do with it? Well, you shall remember Jehovah your Elohim, for it is he that giveth you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto your fathers as it is this day. Now, in the previous slide, the wealth part of the covenant, when you look at Jehovah's covenant with the children of Israel, you see the blessings for obeying the commands. You see the, the, the curses for disobeying the commands. This is... The covenant that Israel entered into, the sides of the covenant doesn't manifest itself until you get into the latter part of Deuteronomy. So you don't see this in Exodus, in Leviticus, in, in, in Numbers. You see bits and pieces of the promises that the Almighty is promising. But in Deuteronomy 28, he lays it all out. Here's the blessings. You, you want these, then this is required of you. Obey. The curses, just forget. Forget the commandments. Forget to work to walk 
in obedience to the instructions that I'm giving you, and you'll see the opposite side of the promises. Those are the things that is not for you. However, it's your choice. So, what is he saying? This wealth is part of his covenant. And this covenant, which he swore unto your fathers, as it is this day. The thing that Israel is about to enter into is the promises that the Almighty promised Abraham, Isaac, Israel, and now their children, the children of Israel. This word power, the strength, the power, the might, and this comes from the Almighty. It is the Almighty that gives us the strength. It is he who gives us the power, the might, the ability to make us able to do whatever it is he's putting in us to do. Why? Because he's trying to prosper you and I. He wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to be successful. The main reason I believe, based on the word of Elohim, as to why he wants you to be prosperous and successful is not just to make Israel jealous, but it's to cause the world to see what the Almighty does in the lives of those who put their faith in him. It's that simple. There's something that the world, no matter what it does, it can never accomplish, and that's peace. Now, you and I both know that if you don't have food, you ain't got peace. If you don't have food and, 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 and drink and shelter, then peace eludes you. The peace that the Almighty gives you is the kind of peace that comes when every one of your needs are met. Now imagine, all of your needs are met. You don't have no health issues. You don't have financial issues. You don't have substance issues. All of your needs are met. You're secure in the fact that your relationship with him is intact. Your family as well. Everything around you, all that you put your hands to is doing well. When you go to sleep at night, you can sleep well. You wake up. You don't wake up with aches and pains and worries and fears and dread. You wake up. This is the day Jehovah has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You go through the day. You, you think about the, 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 the day as you lay your feet, you get your, your head and, and, and on your pillow and you give thanks to the Almighty for all that he's done. And then tomorrow you get to repeat it all over again. And then it's repeat, repeat, repeat. This is the way the Almighty wants us to live. Not in fear, not worrying, not doubting, not running. So he has promised us wealth. But, all of this comes from remembering him and understanding that we are not to pursue stuff, we are to pursue him. If we pursue him, the stuff follows. Verse 19, and it shall be, if thou do at all forget Jehovah your God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day, you shall surely perish. This is the promise. It is not the promise that he desires for us to experience. It's the promise that comes if we forget to walk in his ways. And then finally, verse 20. As the nations which destroyeth before your face, as the nations which Jehovah destroyeth before your face, so shall you perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of Jehovah your Elohim, unto the voice of Jehovah your Elohim. What is the message? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Jehovah. The words that came from the mouth of Jehovah came via the voice of Jehovah to Moses. Remember, Jehovah spoke. Moses wrote. Jehovah spoke. Moses wrote. Amen? 
Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for this study. Help us to glean from the things that we have heard. Show us how to take that which you have shown us, that which you have spoken to us, and how to incorporate it in our lives today and from this day forward. Help us to remember always that our life is based on the words that you have spoken, that your word, your commandments are life itself that we might walk in, obey, and live according to the words that you have spoken, that we might see the prosperity and success that is promised through obeying your instruction. Amen. Comments? Questions? Amen. Any comments? No questions? If not, I know this went pretty quick, but uh, that's fine too. So let us, let us, uh, now tomorrow night, we're going to be for our Sabbath premiere the second part of Now Concerning Spiritual Gifts. And this particular teaching, uh, brothers and sisters, is really designed to help us to understand the gifts of the Spirit. And this, uh, as we're going through uh, the First Corinthians, the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, then we're kind of jumping ahead in this partic particular teaching because the spiritual gifts are mentioned in chapter 12, and, and we've yet to get to uh, chapter 12. So this is a precursor of what's going to happen. We're going to get into it a little bit more when we get into chapter 12 as we're going through our verse-by-verse -verse study of Corinthians. And on Sabbath, we are in chapter 6. So we'll be covering chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians this Sabbath, man's law, Versus God's law. We're going to be looking at the first uh, chapters uh, 6, verses 1 through 20, and that will be our discussion. Now, if you haven't um, registered for the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, then please do so there on our website, ArthurBaileyMinistries.com, and there should be a place on the website right there. I think that it got put there um, on the watch page right at the very top. So if you haven't signed up for our uh, newsletter, and you can subscribe there on that watch page for announcements and inspirational weekly updates, and right underneath there, you can RSVP for Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. Now, if you're going to join with us here live, you certainly want to RSVP, but even if you're joining with us online, you can also RSVP for the Feast of Weeks and let us know that you're going to be joining us. Now, this page has lots of information, and at the bottom, you'll see that the first teachings uh, from the Biblical New Year, our New Year celebration, all the way up to Passover, the first day of unleavened bread, the seventh day of unleavened bread, are all under this particular banner, the Feast of Jehovah for 2024. And so those teachings are there. If you missed any of them or if you'd like to watch them again, you certainly can do that. And they're all there for your uh, learning. So for those of you who would like to support our ministries, we're going to give you an opportunity at this time to support us. On our donate page, you'll find that there are several ways that you can give to our ministry. And there are some fee free ways that you can give, ways to give there. And we encourage you to use either of those methods where 100% of your contribution comes to us. Whatever method you use will certainly be greatly appreciated. And just want to take a moment and pray for those of you who are considering giving and those of you who are. Father, we just thank you for those who support this ministry with their tithe, their offerings, their first fruits. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless them. Let none lack as a result of their giving, but to the contrary, cause the windows of heaven 
to open the blessings of heaven, the abundance of heaven, to bountifully be out poured upon them so much so that they have not enough room to collect them all. We thank you for not only blessing us, but making us a blessing, using us even in the body of Messiah to be a blessing to others. Continue to be glorified in us, in our giving and in our living in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. So for those of you who would like to support us, you can certainly use any of those methods if there are no other questions or no other comments then we will father we just thank you for yannick as we join our faith in agreement in prayer for this 12 year old yannette as she's going through some gastrointestinal challenges we ask father that you touch her body right now touch her deliver her we pray your hedge of protection around her. Show her that you are right there with her. Father, you know this one. You know each of these children, but you especially know this one. Your intercessor, your warrior. And Father, we just decree no weapons formed against her shall prosper. And for your power to manifest in her body from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, make her hold, deliver her in Messiah Yeshua. We rebuke all fear, cast it out, cast it away, and pray for faith, supernatural faith, to manifest in her and to reverse this attack of the enemy against her body. Thank you for her. Bless her in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Well, saints, this is day number 12 of our count up to Pentecost, and we are certainly looking forward to being together with you. If there are no other questions, no other comments, then we're going to bring our time here to a close. Father, we just thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the blessings of your presence. We thank you for your word here tonight. And we just honor you. We incorporate those things in us even as you reveal them to us. Help us to walk them out. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless in his presence with exceedingly great joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forever. May Jehovah bless you and keep you. May Jehovah cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all again for joining in with us. Remember, we can't do what we do without you. Your prayers and your support are greatly needed and greatly appreciated. And until Shabbat, Shalom Saints. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4 when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he wit, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts.
and all nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.